Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. Good. Are you sure? Yes. Okay, good. So unlike my last message, this morning I am going to invite you to open your Bibles to our scriptures, and they're in Matthew 9, verses 14 through 17 today. For those that are visiting, we always do that, but two weeks ago, I challenged the church not to open their Bibles for a reason, because I wanted to ask a question about verses 1 and 2, and the answer was in verse 3. Makes sense, doesn't it? Well, I got some pushback. And you know what? I I like that. I like that we're a church family that wants to open our Bibles, that wants to see God's Word. So thank you for that. The other thing I want to thank you for is that you trusted me enough to go through that little exercise. So open your Bibles now to Matthew 9. And you know what? I will open mine now, Miss Lynn. (laughs) Oh, and by the way, you see what color my Bible is? The Bible was meant to be red. Yeah, it's going to be that kind of morning. (laughs) Now, in our scriptures this morning, we're going to see Jesus questioned about fasting. But his answer covers far more than this religious discipline. He is going to make the most out of this opportunity by using it to explain what Christianity is all about. So we're going to hear one answer, and it's going to be prompted by two questions, and then followed by his support for his answer with three parables. And hopefully you remember what a parable is. It's a story that's told that Jesus will tell, but it has a biblical meaning to it. And his answer this morning... um, well, we'll get to that. You'll just see, it's, I love his answer, and that's what we're going to focus on this morning. Now, before we have to count any higher than one, two, three, let's have a word of prayer. Father, Heavenly Father, how we long to know your will for our church family and your will for our lives. So, Lord, this morning... We open your word to seek it because that's the best place for us to find it. May your Holy Spirit guide our hearts and our minds to understand the purpose in Jesus' teachings today. Help us grasp the intent of his responses and how they're just as applicable today for us as they were back then when he spoke them. And we thank you, Father, for providing Jesus, for providing him as our atoning sacrifice on the cross. And it's in his name, the mighty name of Jesus, that we pray. Amen. When we first began our study here in Matthew, our study of chapter 9, we mentioned the growing concern that the Pharisees and the scribes had with Jesus' teachings and with his increased popularity with the people. I think maybe there was a little bit of jealousy going on there. And and we mentioned that a standoff was beginning. Well, that standoff is now underway because Jesus was not teaching in accordance with their extra-biblical understanding of God's word. And this is an important detail we need to keep in mind today as we go through these verses. So much so that I'm going to mention it later on as a reminder for you. Jesus was all about God's will and getting back to God's original intent for his laws and commands. He was laser focused on God's righteousness. These Jewish religious leaders of their day, the Pharisees and the scribes, they were all about their interpretation of God's law. And their primary concern 
had become their own self-righteousness. Spence covered that last week. He also explained last week how this this self-righteous group refused to associate with certain groups of people, with with sin-sick people that they considered unclean or broken or flawed, all while failing to realize that they were also sinners in need of a Savior. But Jesus was associating with those flawed groups. He accepted them. He valued them. He ate with them. He healed them. He forgave them. He befriended them. He even called some of them to serve alongside him. He called a tax collector to serve alongside him. And now these guys, these these Pharisees, they're a part of a group today that's going to be asking Jesus another question. And once again, we'll see why Jesus is considered the greatest teacher that ever walked the face of the earth. Because today, we're going to explore their question to him, Jesus' question to their question, Jesus' illustrations related to their question. But before I read the question, I'd just like to explain a little bit about who's asking the question. There's a lot of questioning going on here. Now, in the parallel gospel of Mark 2, he mentions that John, John's disciples, and this would be John the Baptist, his disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. They were in the process of fasting when you read that in Mark 2. Now, in Luke's gospel, in chapter 5, he also mentions both groups. But his account implies that perhaps the Pharisees are asking this question. But here in Matthew's account, he clearly states it was John's disciples speaking. So when we combine all three of those accounts, I believe it's clear that both groups were present and most likely with different agendas. So in verse 14, we hear their question. It says, Then John's disciples came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? fast. I think for um, the disciples of John the Baptist, this was a very genuine attempt to truly try to understand what's going on. Probably not so with the Pharisee group. Now, to better understand Jesus's reply to their question, we should keep in mind his teachings from Matthew 6, That we, you know, we explored that. (laughs) Jeff just kind of commented on this way back on June 9th. It's taken us a little while to get to chapter 9 now, but that's okay. So we have to keep this in mind. These Pharisees were known to fast twice a week. Not because God's law mandated it, but as a public exercise to display their own spirituality. Jesus called this hypocritical fasting in Matthew 6. And there he was referring to Isaiah 58, where God's word rebuked self-righteous fasting. Now the law did prescribe a day of fasting on the day of atonement. That's from Leviticus 16. But all other fasts were to be voluntary for specific reasons, like uh, repentance or mourning, or grief, or even uh, periods of intense prayer time. But these Pharisees, they had twisted God's purpose for fasting. So here we see yet another example of their extra-biblical laws promoting a works-based theology. Now those of you that have been here at Montrose Christian, you know that from time to time, I'm just kind of this way, Sometimes I get this twisted way of viewing some of the events in the Bible. 
I don't know. I don't know if it's a curse or a blessing. It just comes to me. So when I read that Mark 2 uh, account there where it says that both groups are fasting. So I picture, I picture John's disciples here and the Pharisees and their disciples here and, and they're fasting and they're, they're denying themselves. They're, they're hungry. They're going without. And they look over and they see Jesus' disciples feasting. They're fasting those guys are feasting and they want to know why what's going on so Jesus answers but he begins with a question to their question look at the first part of verse 15 he says Jesus said to them can the wedding guest be sad while the groom is with them so he kind of answers with this vivid picture. Now your Bibles likely have a reference listed for that phrase wedding guests like mine does uh, to mean the sons of the bridal chamber or it might say children of the bridal chamber. So Jesus is comparing their time together, his time with his disciples. He's comparing that to a Jewish wedding. And basically he's saying, I'm the bridegroom I'm here with my bride. I'm here with the sons of the bridal chamber. And now is a time for joy and celebration. And I came across <clears throat> an explanation by William Barclay this week. And he explains a Jewish wedding like this. He says, a Jewish wedding was a time of special festivity. The unique feature of it was that the couple who were married did not go away for a honeymoon like we do. They spend their honeymoon at home. For a week after the wedding, open house was kept. The bride and bridegroom were treated as and even addressed as king and queen. I'd never heard that before, but that's interesting. And during that week, their closest friends shared all the joy and all the festivities with them. Barclay then goes on to explain how this joyful festivity might only come once in a lifetime. So while the wedding is going on, it would be certainly inappropriate to fast. A wedding, when the bride and groom are together, is a time for joy and celebration, not a time for mourning and sorrow, which, by the way, was one of the reasons from the Old Testament for fasting. So in his unique and extraordinary way, Jesus is teaching them and us that Christianity is all about a relationship with Jesus. It's a relationship that's filled with joy and delight. And Christianity is unlike any other religion, Every other religion is filled with, with performance, right? Some kind of rituals or maybe traditions, maybe even mandatory to-do list, which can lead to a life of drudgery because that's more of a, a have-to life. I have to do these things. Whereas Christianity is about God coming to his people and taking them to be his bride. It's a relationship leading to joy and delight. And that's more of a get to kind of life. We get to fulfill his purpose for us. We get to be in his presence. We get to pray, have communication with God the Father. Now we should also note that by indicating he was the bridegroom, Jesus was claiming to be God. God frequently says in the Old Testament, I am the bridegroom or I am your husband, you are my bride. And you can Google that, you'll find plenty of references, uh, Isaiah 54, Jeremiah 2, Jeremiah 3, Jeremiah 31, Hosea 2, that's just a handful of them right there. Now Jesus comes along and he says, that's me. I'm the bridegroom. And Jesus is claiming to be God. And his listeners, they must have been blown away by what he's saying. 
But Jesus also knows something else. He knows he's going to die. He knew his crucifixion on the cross was coming. And so he begins to answer their question using illustrations related that they would understand to support both of those questions. Look at the end of verse 15. He says, the time will come. You can also read that as the days will come when the groom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. His words are a reminder that even that kind of joy comes with a challenge. And right now, these guys are experiencing incredible joy that comes from following him. But they will face trouble. They will face hardships. They will face the agony of seeing him crucified on the cross. And that will be their time for grief, their time for mourning and fasting. But at this point, they probably don't see that coming right now. So Jesus gives this curious crowd, inquisitive crowd, an illustration of a Jewish wedding, followed by an answer describing his relationship with them. And now he shares a couple of parables that will, well, all of those that are present, they will get this. We might struggle if we read through these parables sometimes, but in their culture, they would understand Most of them would understand, those with ears to hear. Now, he begins with an age-old problem. What do we do with our old clothes, our old garments? Do we donate them and let them kind of decide what to do with them? Yeah, most of us are going, yeah, that's probably best. Do we throw them away? Do we try and patch them up? You know, I mean, if your favorite old faded shirt has a hole in it, Do you try and salvage it? Eh, You probably should just get rid of it. And by the way, if you haven't seen it for a while, maybe your wife or kids have already gotten rid of it. (laughs) It just seems like the longer we hold on to our old, faded, maybe out of date clothing, the harder it is to toss them out. The harder it is to let go. Well, in verse 16, Jesus uses old clothing as another illustration of the Christian life. And he starts with two words that we might keep in mind when trying to decide what to do with our old clothing. Look at verse 16. He says, no one, no one patches an old garment with unshrunk cloth. Some of your translations say unshrunk new cloth. Because the patch pulls away from the garment and makes the tear worse. Our sewers are going, yeah, hello, we know that. Jesus says, no one does this. And for a couple of very good reasons. First of all, if you're going to tear or cut a piece off of your new garment, well, you just ruined your new garment. And then if you try to patch it onto the old one, the color isn't going to match and the pattern probably doesn't match. And to make it even worse, let's say you do patch that garment and then you wash it. Well, the patch from the new unshrunk garment pulls away, right? Because it's got to shrink. And it pulls away from the old garment, making things even worse, Jesus says. So in the end... All you have are two ruined garments. And your wife or your kids are probably going to throw both of them away. But what is Jesus really illustrating here with this parable? With what is the biblical meaning of this story here? His point is that the relationship based gospel cannot be patched into the Pharisees' current system of works-based salvation. That's why his teaching was completely at odds with the Pharisees and the scribes. Let's go back to that reminder I promised earlier. 
Jesus was all about God's will and getting back to God's original intent for the laws and commands, for his laws and commands. The old garment in this parable is not the Old Testament. It's not God's law, God's eternal law, which is holy, righteous, and good. And which, by the way, as we've already learned earlier in Matthew, is the law Jesus came to fulfill, not to replace. No, the old garment here represents the extra-biblical, ritualistic, legalistic religion of the Pharisees based on their traditions with the thousands of man-made laws and regulations, the oral laws that actually obscured the law of God and it, put, it placed an undue heavy burden on the people. So this is our key takeaway today. Forget about old clothes, okay? Here's the, the takeaway. This is what I want you to remember if you remember nothing else today. Jesus did not come to patch that pharisaical system, but to replace it with the garment of salvation. The good news of salvation, which is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. No works-based righteous system can be patched into the gospel of God's grace. Jesus then tells another parable using wineskins to further drive this point home. And notice again how he once, how he once again, he emphasizes these two words. No one. Look at the uh, beginning of verse 17. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the skins burst, the wine spills out, and the skins are ruined. Now, back in their day, wine was typically stored in containers made from animal skins. And Jesus said that it would be just as foolish and just as futile to put new wine into old wine skins because the gases from the new wine would burst the old uh, skins, causing the wine to spill. The old wine skins are destroyed. And here we are once again both would be useless. He's reminding them of a universal truth. That's why he says, no one does this. We know better. He then illustrates how it does work at the end of verse 17. He says, no. They put new wine into fresh wine skins and both are preserved. New wine had to be stored in the new wine skins because they're still supple enough to expand during that fermentation process. Like the garment parable, Jesus highlights the futility and impossibility of mixing the gospel of grace with any system of works-based righteousness for salvation. God's grace is not compatible with any such system. Now, unfortunately, the scribes and the Pharisees who had gathered to challenge and most likely criticize Jesus that day, they're far more interested in hanging on to their old ways and their old traditions, which in many ways means they're worshiping their past and not God. As we wrap up this morning, I believe there are some lessons that we can take home from this, from today's verses, and apply to our lives. Number one, joy comes from being in the presence of Jesus. The one who walks with Christ radiates that same joy to others. You can't help it. And regardless of your situation, which leads us to our second lesson. Only the joy of heaven lasts forever. No earthly joy does. I don't care how well you, you learn and live by the rules and the regulations, all of your earthly desires, 
your earthly joys will one day end. It's just one of the great certainties of life. And that leads us to a third lesson. Now this one, this one would eventually become a challenge for his disciples and every Christian after them. Because I don't believe, I said it before, I don't believe his disciples really grasp the reality of the words Jesus used when he said, the time will come when the groom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. They've experienced this Christian joy of following him just as we do. But here's the challenge. Lesson number three. Are you ready for the Christian cross? The Christian walk brings its joy, but it also brings its blood, sweat, and tears. Now those challenges don't take our joy away, but nonetheless, they must be faced. Are you ready for both? The Christian joy and the Christian cross. You know, Jesus turned a simple question about fasting into an explanation of what Christianity is all about. Jesus is the bridegroom. He has demonstrated his love for his bride by giving his life for her. He delights in his bride and he loves her with an everlasting, proven love. Let's close in prayer. Father, what a joy we have in your son, Jesus. And what a privilege we have to experience a relationship with him. And we look forward to the promise of everlasting joy with you in eternity. Thank you for making that possible for those of us that have put our faith and trust in Jesus, your son. He told us that in this world we would have troubles, but to take heart because he has overcome this world. May we always be prepared to face our Christian cross courageously and look forward to the heavenly feast to come. And Father, this morning we seek to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen.